Hello, I am Linda C. McCabe, author of Quest of the Warrior Maiden and Fate of the Saracen Knight. And this presentation is from a paper that I delivered in July 2016 at the 15th Triennial Congress of the International Courtly Literature Society held on the campus of the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm recording this to share it with others who weren't there to see it at the time. So I'm going to share my screen. And so Orlando Furioso's Archetypes and the Twistings of Expected Plot Expectations. Joseph Campbell famously described the commonalities of myths and stories told throughout the world as the hero with a thousand faces, meaning that regardless of the name of the particular hero or the locale in which the monster was fought, there was an underlying mythos capturing our imaginations. That is why these heroic stories persist throughout the ages and continue to be propagated for new generations. One method that allows readers or audiences to recognize the significance of what role each character plays in the story, whether they are hero, ally, or adversary, is by using stock figures or archetypes. I use the term archetype differently than that what was described by Carl Jung, so I am not limited to his set of 12 archetypes. My use is more in line with recognizing stock figures that have become icons in literature and drama. 2016 marked the 500th anniversary of the original publication of Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. And in honor of that landmark, this paper will examine the archetypes used for several of the major characters, as well as how Ariosto did not follow the expectations of Campbell's monomyth plot conventions that are inherent in many of these types of heroic tales told throughout the world. I want to first acknowledge Ariosto's masterpiece was one contribution in a cycle of legends of Charlemagne that were told and retold in the south of France and north of Italy for many centuries. His work was a continuation of this legend cycle and built upon the characterizations and plot points that were created by others. The most notable influence for him was Matteo Maria Boiardo's Orlando Innamorato, which was an unfinished poem that Ariosto was hired to complete by his patrons, the noble house of Desta in Ferrara, Italy. Now, to start with my analysis, we'll start with the hero in the title, Orlando. Ariosto described him as being incredibly strong and almost invulnerable. His skin had been enchanted so that it could not be cut with a blade and his only vulnerable spot was on the soles of his feet. That conjures up the archetype of Achilles, who had a similar vulnerable spot on his heel. Both were fierce warriors and able to withstand attacks that would have killed others without such magical protections. But beyond Achilles, I believe that Orlando's character characterization is more closely aligned with that of the Greek demigod of Heracles, better known by his Roman name of Hercules. Orlando's descent into madness is precipitated by his discovery that his beloved Angelica had given her heart and body to another man. Orlando divests himself of his armor, clothes, and begins uprooting trees as a demonstration of his fury. He becomes feral and loses all of his ability to reason. This dramatic change in Orlando is illustrated by a mural in the Ariosto room in the Il Casino Giustiani Massimo al Latano in Rome, Italy. On the left is the dis 
despondent Orlando after he discovers Angelica and Maduro's names written on trees. And then on the right is the madman who instills fear in all who sees him. Orlando is depicted here as carrying a club and has fabric covering his nakedness. This is similar to the iconic depiction Hercules carrying a club and wearing the skin of the Nemean lion. Hercules was famous for having gone mad and killing his wife and children. To atone for those crimes, he was given 12 labors. Each of them were considered to be impossible to complete. The inhuman strength and madness shared between Hercules and Orlando makes that comparison work. That, and after their sanity was restored, they were able to redeem themselves in the eyes of the public and are again seen as heroic. Angelica, the princess of Cathay, was the object of Orlando's unrequited love. He was a one of a number of unsatisfied suitors. Her storyline began in Matteo Maria Boyardo's Orlando Innamorato during the Pentecost tournament for Charlemagne, where Angelica was described as entering the hall as, she seemed to be the morning star, the lily, and the garden rose. In short, to tell the truth of her, none was so much beauty seen. Angelica and her brother Argalia had been sent on a mission by their father, King Galifron, to capture Charlemagne and his knights in a rigged game where the winner of the joust against Argalia would win Angelica. However, Argalia had an enchanted lance, meaning no one would have beaten him. This wicked scheme soon fell apart and chaos ensued with dozens of knights pursuing Angelica. Later, the princess magically retreated to her home in Cathay, where a war was raging by several armies, each representing their kings who wanted to lay claim to Angelica. This has many echoes to that of Helen of Troy. Helen, the daughter of Leda and Zeus, was considered to be the most beautiful woman on earth. Leda's husband, King Tyndareus, had worried about fighting amongst Helen's many suitors. So he made them pledge to honor his choice for her husband and help her win back, win her back should anyone abduct her. This vow caused kings from throughout Greece to come to the aid of King Menelaus of Sparta after Helen was taken to Troy with Paris. This was the cause of the legendary Trojan War. Helen and Angelica were beautiful women who were pursued by countless men and forced by their father to use their beauty to advance the king's ambitions. Their beauty caused bloodshed and death to thousands. As a woman, I find that archetype to be frightening and I do not identify with Angelica or her plight. Instead, I find myself more drawn to the character of Bradamante. She is the niece of Charlemagne and a respected warrior maiden. Ariosto praises her beauty as well as declaring her to be equal in courage, might, and expertise to that of her famous brother, Rinaldo. Archetypically, I feel that Bradamante's character had two major influences. The first was the Greek goddess Athena. She was the goddess of wisdom and victory and well known for her cool headed strategic planning. But no man ever captured Athena's heart. The second influence was that of the historical figure of Joan of Arc or Jean d'Arc. I find that comparison more compelling and feel that it was not incidental, but instead a deliberate attempt by Ariosto to invoke the parallels between the literary heroine and the real life French martyr. Jean d'Arc was burned at the stake in 1431 at the age of 19. She had been known for riding a white horse, carrying a banner made of white fabric, was called the maid, had cropped hair, and dressed in men's clothing. Bradamante 
was a young woman, most likely a teenager, and is described as having a white shield with a white plume, and is referred to as the maid. The color white is known for the symbolic virtues of purity and innocence. Bradamante also had cropped hair due to a blow to the back of her head by an enemy warrior near the end of Voyage's poem, Orlando Inamorato, and a hermit cut her hair to tend to the wound. Ariosto neglected to mention the length of Bradamante's hair until finally in Canto 25, when her twin brother, Ricciardetto, relates a tale to Ruggiero of how people commonly confuse him and his sister, Bradamante, since they have such great resemblance to each other. This was compounded when she lost her tresses due to the head injury. Bradamante also disguised herself as a man when she approached the thief Brunello at an inn and sought to have him serve as her guide to find where Ruggiero was being held captive. Name, sex, race, family, and place of birth she hides, watching his hands for all she's worth. The biggest differences between Bradamante and Jeanne d'Arc is that the literary heroine is revered by her king, is never accused of heresy, has a love life, and a much better fate than the historical figure. Moving on to the analysis of Ruggiero, he is the prophesied youth orphan raised in obscurity. He is first mentioned in Orlando Inamorato when King Agramante of North Africa convenes a war council to plan an invasion of the Frankish Empire. The King of Garamanta warned that the only path to victory depended on finding Ruggiero, who is a warrior whose prowess is unmatched on earth. Ruggiero's father was murdered before he was born, and his mother died shortly after giving birth to him. This orphan, was raised by the wizard of Atlanta in a castle that was enchanted to be invisible on Mount Corena in Africa. Great effort and several expe expeditions were made to find and recruit this young warrior into Agramante's service. That brings us to the competing magical forces inherent in Orlando Furioso, wizard, crone, and temptress. Atlanta, the wizard, he fulfills the wizard archetype. He is described as white-haired, wrinkled, at least 70 years of age, and replete with a long beard. Atlanta's ma magic is used primarily to protect Ruggiero from fulfilling his destiny and dying far too young. To that end, Atlanta holds Ruggiero in three different enchanted castles and sends him to Elchina's island. A similar, but competitive archetype to the wizard is that of the wise woman or crone. Melissa is an enchantress and an opposing magical force to that of Atlanta. She wants Ruggiero and Bradamante to be joined by marriage while Atlanta is trying to prevent it. Alcina is a sorceress who has an insatiable sexual appetite. She abducts paramours and then after she tires of them, turns them into souvenirs. Some lovers become statues and others become trees. Circe, from Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, was a sorceress who became lovers with Odysseus after she turned his men into pigs. There are other characters that I feel have corresponding archetypes, but a comprehensive listing and justification of each of these is beyond the scope of this paper. I will now proceed to the discussion of Orlando, or Ariosto's twisting of plot conventions that we have come to expect in Campbell's described monobith. Title characters, like Orlando, should be the focus of the story. He should be the hero who is given the hero's journey. He was not. While a large portion of the story follows Orlando's many adventures, he is not one given the call to adventure. Instead, his story arc began with him becoming a knight errant, following his beloved, and then losing all sense 
when he discovered his love was unrequited. Later, his wits were magically restored and he redeemed himself as a paladin. Hardly the expected character arc for the titular hero of a story. The other major plot line in this epic poem dealt with the love story of Bradamante and Ruggiero. Usually, it is the prophesied hero raised in obscurity who is given the call to adventure. But instead, Ariosto gave it to Bradamante, the maiden, and Melissa, the crone, was the one who delivered it. Bradamante's quest was to rescue Ruggiero from being held captive by the wizard Atlanta. She was to release him, get him to be baptized as a Christian before marrying her, and later their progeny would restore the glory of Italy. The downside to that prophecy was that Ruggiero was also fated to be murdered by her family's enemies, the House of Magazza, after their marriage. Atlanta was aware of that possible fate and that was the cause of his repeated attempts to keeping the couple apart. Another major difference in the plot convention was that Ruggiero had two possible fates. One, where he converted to Christianity and married Bradamante. The other prophecy was if he remained a Muslim, he would be the cause of Charlemagne's defeat, causing the downfall of the Frankish Empire devastating Christendom. That was the prophecy that Agramante, the commander of the Muslim army, knew about and why he was so desperate to have Ruggiero join his ranks. The culmination of the poem was not the defeat of the invading Muslim army and the end of the war, but rather the resolution of the seemingly impossible love story between Bradamante and Ruggiero two renowned warriors on opposing sides of holy war. I have one more analysis of the symbolism of Ariosto's work that impresses me. Bradamante the Maiden is given the call to adventure in a cave, which symbolically represents the womb. This quest is given to her by a crone, and Bradamante is told that to succeed, she must become a mother and bear Ruggiero's child. Mother or maiden, mother, crone are the three phases of a woman's life. Bradamante, being a warrior, is associated with the blade, a symbol of masculinity, and is being called to transform into a chalice, a symbol of femininity. I am astonished that over five centuries ago, a man wove powerful feminist symbolic material into his masterpiece, and it resonates with me. That is one of the many reasons that I find myself championing this piece of classic literature by adapting it into novels for this new generation to discover and enjoy. If you're interested in joining my mailing list, please go to my website of lindacmckay.com or questofthewarriormaiden.com. If you are interested in picking up a copy of my books, they are in trade paperback and ebook formats and available online. There are also signed copies with a pithy inscription available at kazoobooks.com, an independent bookstore in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And if you want to correspond with me, my email is lynda.mccabe at gmail.com. Thank you for your time.